Andre, you can begin now. Okay. Hello and welcome to our webinar. My name is Andre Pino. I'm with CloudBees, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, the topic of our webinar today is continuous delivery and pipeline traceability with Jenkins and Chef. Today's webinar is brought to you by CloudBees, uh, the Jenkins Enterprise Company, and the leaders in providing continuous delivery solutions powered by Jenkins, and also by Chef, the IT automation leader, helping DevOps teams automate IT infrastructure. Today's webinar is just one in a series of business and technology best practices with Jenkins that we've been running both in seminar form as well as in webinar form around the world. So be on the lookout for seminars in a city near you or uh, for future webinars on a lot of uh, topics uh, related to Jenkins and continuous delivery. We have a content-packed uh, session for you today with uh, two experts, one from, uh, uh, Jen one from CloudBees and Jenkins and one chef expert. George Miranda, uh, joining us from Chef, is a partner integration engineer. And Adam Papai from CloudBees is a senior software engineer. And they'll be discussing uh, today's webinar and providing you also a demo today, so it'll be uh, very interesting. But it, also, I wanted to make sure that you understand that today is your opportunity uh, to learn, to learn about this top of, topic of traceability with Jenkins and with Chef. And so please be prepared to ask any questions that you have. You can submit them in the Q&A pane uh, within WebEx, within your WebEx control there, uh, at any time during the session. So if someone mentions something and you have a question about it, submit it in the Q&A pane. We'll, we'll hold it till the end and be sure to answer it. Or at the end of the, uh, at the end of the presentation, at the end of the session, you can also submit your questions. So I just wanted to talk about continuous delivery for just a second. Continuous delivery is a process that runs from the uh, beginning of the software delivery cycle uh, all the way to the end. And it really starts when the, uh, with, when software development folks commit a change to an application and it goes all the way through the entire delivery process from build, test, through staging, deploying, and actually moving that application into production. It encompasses the continuous integration process, which is the build and test uh, aspect, but also encompasses the deployment process. Today, this continuous delivery is being managed by uh, a number of different types of teams. One of the uh, biggest trends in the industry are DevOps teams. This is a combination of both development and operations and release teams who work together to ensure that that process is automated and is repeatable uh, over and over again. For the business, one of the major benefits of continuous delivery is the ability for the business to get immediate feedback on a change made to an application, the impact that will have on the business, and be able to determine what the next step is in terms of that application and any changes that need to be made. So keep this in mind, continuous delivery is not just a technical topic, it's also a business topic because continuous delivery helps to accelerate time to market for new applications and new features of applications, helping the business to really understand the impact that it has on their goals and objectives. <clears throat> today's topic is traceability with Jenkins and Chef. And so today we're going to talk about the fingerprinting technology that has been uh, put into place between Chef and Jenkins to allow all the assets associated with an application to be traced from the, throughout the entire software delivery process. And this becomes important because it enables you to really understand what assets are actually uh, in production and becomes very, very important and very helpful when you have problems in, in production to really understand what assets made up that application uh, that you might be having trouble with. So without further ado, 
I'd like to turn it over to, to George uh, Miranda from CHEF, who will discuss this in, in more uh, detail. George, over to you. Thanks, Andre. Uh, give me one sec while I share my screen. All right. Great, here we go. Maybe not. <laughs> All right, excellent. Oops, let me go back. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is George Miranda. I am a uh, technical evangelist at Chef. Uh, I'm also a partner ecosystem engineer, which means that I get to make Chef play nice with uh, strategic partner tooling. Uh, I'm a recovering sysadmin. Uh, I was a web operations infrastructure engineer for over 15 years. Uh, sometimes in roles that were labeled as being on the development side of the house, mostly in operations, uh, at least in title anyway, right? In reality, job functions were sort of all over the map. Uh, but here's my contact info. You can reach me, gmiranda at chef.io, or you can also talk to me on Twitter, gmiranda23. Uh, joining us today also will be Adam. Adam, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Adam, are you on mute? All right, well, uh, joining us will be uh, Adam Papai, uh, Senior Software Engineer at CloudBees. There's Adam's contact info as well. Um, but uh, let's get into what we'll be talking about today. Uh, I'm gonna start with a high-level introduction to Chef for those that are new to it or don't know much about what it is that Chef does. Uh, and I'm going to go into a pretty opinionated way of managing your infrastructure with Chef. I'm going to spend a few minutes there, and after, you know, spending three to five minutes there, I'm sure we will all be experts in using Chef. Uh, basically, just going to lay down that foundation so that we can go right into talking about how we use some of those constructs to start uh, adopting continuous delivery patterns. Then we're going to take a very detailed look at the inner workings of a continuous delivery tool chain that is based on Chef and Jenkins. Uh, after we do that, we'll look at some of the challenges uh, in managing binary artifacts and grabbing them out of some uh, artifact repository. And then that's gonna lead right into a demo that we're going to do that Adam's going to lead uh, on how the traceability plugin for Jenkins and Chef further integrates the tool chain and uh, we'll see a demo in the inner workings of that. Uh, hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, as Andre mentioned, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. Uh, let us know your questions as they come up. So with that, let's get right into it. Um, Chef is a configuration management framework, uh, which is to say that it enables you to programmatically describe the state of your application infrastructure. You take that description of state and Chef automates applying that state across many different operating system platforms. Uh, Chef is synonymous with automation, but I'm usually cautious of saying automation to seasoned IT professionals because oftentimes that can get translated as, you know, quote unquote, writing scripts. Um, Chef is a little bit different. Chef is essentially a programming language for your infrastructure. Uh, it allows and encourages you to describe the entire state of configuration that must be applied to bear compute resources, whether those resources are on premise or in the cloud whether they're you know, virtual machines or containers or network switches, storage appliances, or even you know, traditional bare metal servers. You describe the state of your application infrastructure programmatically in what we call recipes. Um, and recipes are then applied item potently by Chef, which means that Chef inspects the state of the system that runs any given recipe. If the state of the system currently matches the state that you've described, then Chef does nothing. But if the state of the system that we found doesn't match what you want, Chef will take corrective action by converging the node into the desired state you've described. So a recommended practice when implementing Chef is to set the Chef client to run on a regular interval. When you set Chef client to run on a regular interval, what that basically does is it ensures that any state that you've described in your recipes is actually the state that's applied to your infrastructure. More importantly, what that does is it establishes a culture that discourages ad hoc and out-of-band change. In order for any change to be persistent, 
it must be captured in a recipe somewhere, or the chef client is going to revert any conflicting change during its next run. So unlike, you know, quote unquote, writing scripts, uh, this state-based approach to configuration management enforces conventions that drive you to having a complete picture of all of the configuration settings that you have and that you manage in your entire stack. Uh, collections of recipes are, uh, are stored into what we call cookbooks. And the real power of Chef is that it allows you to use those recipes to turn your infrastructure into code. Um, infrastructure as code uh, basically means that your infrastructure computing environment has many of the same attributes as your application. Uh, in other words, you can take the same software development lifecycle practices that manage your applications that make those things resilient and apply that same level of resiliency to managing your infrastructure. And when you do that, what happens is your infrastructure becomes versionable, it becomes testable, and it becomes repeatable. Uh, you treat that code base to describe the state of your infrastructure like you do any other code base, right? You put it in source control and you back up any relevant data. And if you have that data backup and that repository of code, you can apply that to bare compute resources and you can re easily rebuild your infrastructure for whatever purpose best meets your needs, whether that's disaster recovery or setting up development sandboxes, doing blue-green deployments, you know, the world is your oyster. So when you use infrastructure as code, uh, what you're doing is you're basically starting with a business continuity plan. You don't tack one on the end as an afterthought. Uh, more importantly, because you can rebuild your entire application stack very easily, it's feasible to bring a reasonable facsimile of production directly into the hands of your developers so that any experimentation that they're doing uh, can be done against consistent replicas of your ultimate destination, which is production. Um, Chef particularly shines in a couple of areas, I think, uh, extensibility and scalability. And in terms of extensibility, what that means is that you don't need to struggle to conform to Chef. Uh, Chef is a flexible open source framework, uh, meaning that Chef adapts to you and your environment and the particular needs of your workflow. Uh, you can describe any resource uh, using small powerful primitives that we include in the framework. But if we don't happen to have one for whatever it is that you're managing, uh, we give you a very non-restrictive DSL that harnesses the full power of the Ruby programming language. Um, so you can have that at your disposal and you can work your way out of any edge case scenarios that you might encounter. Uh, all it takes is a little bit of code. Um, but that's not to say that when you use Chef that you have to start from scratch. Uh, many standard infrastructure configurations are encapsulated by reusable community cookbooks that are available via the Chef Supermarket. Uh, the Chef Supermarket, I have a screenshot of it here, is a free open source service that's available for anyone to use. Um, on the supermarket, you'll find uh, a number of cookbooks that cover a wide variety of common and sometimes not so common use cases. Um, but what this code sharing model allows you to do and infrastructure as code allows you to do is to basically codify the practices that you've learned from managing your applications over the years and share that experience and insight with others. Uh, in terms of scalability, uh, the Chef server is a pretty lightweight process. Uh, the Chef server uh, has an Erlang driven backend that's designed for uh, high concurrency and fault tolerant transactions. Uh, we have a number of customer use cases uh, documenting deployments of Chef servers that manage over 10,000 nodes with a single instance. Uh, the Chef server itself is also open source and available for anyone to use for free. Uh, for mission critical use cases, uh, there's an enterprise Chef server that contains some paid features such as uh, doing high availability, right, setting up a Chef server cluster that is always available to your infrastructure. Uh, features like federation so that you can string those Chef server clusters together. Um, and when you do that, that allows you to uh, meet the needs of even, you know, the world's largest infrastructure footprint. So I dug up this little nugget from TechCrunch. Um, for anybody that's out there scratching their heads, uh, Chef, the company I work for, was once known as Opscode. So it's basically Chef that is able to uh, let Facebook uh, manage its Carl Sagan-sized deployments. Um, the fact that Chef is uh, so easily extensible 
has helped propel the notion of test-driven development for managing infrastructure within the CHEP community. Uh, several po uh, popular testing frameworks and tools exist to help increase your confidence that any change you introduce to your application infrastructure will be applied smoothly. Um, a popular tool of choice for test-driven development is called Test Kitchen. Uh, Test Kitchen is a wrapper around the very handy development program, Vagrant. Uh, both Vagrant and Test Kitchen are tools that were not uh, originally created by Chef, but they are definitely a vital part of our ecosystem. Uh, and what Test Kitchen does is Test Kitchen allows you to pull in the same repository of code that configures production and experiment with making changes to that locally. Uh, you make any changes in, on your local workstation and you use Test Kitchen to provision some cheap throwaway infrastructure. In other words, local VMs that are running on your workstation, right? You provision that cheap throwaway infrastructure and you use Test Kitchen to apply your experimental changes through it via Chef. And you apply it there to this cheap throwaway environment versus some long running critical uh, environment like say a shared integration platform. Uh, you do it there so that you can just experiment willy-nilly and see if these things are gonna work. Uh, the other thing that Test Kitchen does is it'll run a full battery of unit tests against this change to ensure that whatever change is being introduced still meets your organizational coding standards. And so as such, uh, tools like Test Kitchen have become a critical component on the path to continuous delivery with Chef. Uh, just as you manage your application code, uh, it's a natural extension to start managing your infrastructure configuration changes with a CI engine like Jenkins. Uh, Jenkins and Chef go together like peas and carrots, right? Um, just as you continuously build and test your application software, you should also continuously build and test changes that are applied to your infrastructure. Uh, there are a lot of great things about Jenkins. Ooh, I just lost my screen. One sec, guys, sorry about that. Uh, so where was I? Uh, yeah, there are a number of great things about Jenkins, such as the fact that it monitors uh, externally running jobs, uh, and that makes it a natural choice for uh, managing your cookbook release mechanisms. Uh, so in a minute, we'll see how Jenkins becomes another key component of a continuous delivery pipeline. Uh, I love this slide. Slides like this are typically the, the 10,000 foot view of what continuous delivery enables. I think Andre had a very similar slide in his introduction. Uh, and again, the, the idea here is that you enable the ability to ship new ideas at any time. Uh, I'm not gonna spend any time today selling you on the value of continuous delivery. I think Andre did a really good job of that. I think there are plenty of presentations out there that do a really good job of that. Um, but what I am going to do is I'm gonna spend some time drilling down on what this means and what, what the technical mechanisms are so we can start making heads or tails of you know, what exactly we need in order to be able to enable this testing acceptance and, and release loop. So uh, in today's webinar, what we're going to do is we're gonna go through a detailed example of how we would chain together uh, a popular choice of tools to create a continuous delivery pipeline. We're gonna use Git as our collaborative source control manager um, Chef will be responsible for applying new changes and assuring the proper state of our infrastructure. Uh, test Kitchen will be the test harness of choice for verifying Chef code. And Jenkins will listen for and kick off events that are responsible for promoting our change from development all the way out to production. And so we're gonna drill down a little bit further to the thousand foot view. And in order to do that, what we're going to use is this pretty generic, but I think detailed view of an operational tool chain and how these components all interact together. Um, I'll say this before we continue. Uh, there are a lot of different options when it comes to continuous delivery patterns, and there's way more nuance than we're gonna be able to cover in, in just this hour, even with the thousand foot view. Um, and just because I'm putting this workflow out there, this does not mean that this is a one size fits all prescriptive approach. Um, again, this is a pretty genericized workflow uh, that I use to illustrate how these various components commonly come together. Um, but this sample model, even though it's simplistic, uh, I frequently use with different organizations looking to start down this path 
because I think it sets a very effective baseline and, and this kind of jumping off point to get some real discussion moving around identifying what the key considerations are, uh, you know, what the technology is, and then, you know, figure out how this applies to our particular unique workflows. Uh, this model also presumes that uh, all state in your infrastructure is managed via a chef cookbook. So when we start by making any change, right, and any change, when I say everything is managed by a cookbook, this applies to all sorts of changes, right, whether that is, uh, you know, us tweaking a configuration file for Nginx, right, or you want to change the memory heap allocation of your Java stack, or you want to delete local users, right, or you even want to deploy a new version of your application code. Um, any change that we introduce on live running systems can and should uh, be managed by a cookbook. And typically cookbooks correspond one-to-one -one for a particular piece of software, uh, like say you would have a cookbook for Redis or a cookbook for Cassandra or a cookbook for MySQL. Uh, or you can structure cookbooks to apply one-to-one -to, -one to a, a particular bit of functionality. Say you have a cookbook for applying security settings or a cookbook that deploys your new application versions uh, to your app servers. So in this particular model, right, whenever we introduce a new change, we do it by creating a new short-lived branch of the cookbook that contains our corresponding recipe that is responsible for implementing this change. Uh, and so whoever is introducing this change, be it someone that is in development or someone that's operations, or even if it's somebody in security or QA, right? It's basically anybody that is contributing to managing the running and state of your uh, application stack, uh, those folks you should consider developers, right? Your infrastructure is code. All of those folks, anybody that is introducing a change should be able to work locally on their workstation to test this change. Um, and again, right, one of, the, one of the goals of infrastructure as code is to bring production into the hands of your developers. And with infrastructure as code, that doesn't just mean the folks working on your application code, that means anybody that is contributing to the, the configuration of this stack. Right, welcome to DevOps. So on our local workstation, right, as we are making a change, we use a tool like Test Kitchen to iterate against uh, our existing cookbook code and just very quickly smoke test on any of the changes on our short-lived cookbook branch, right? You use a tool like Test Kitchen, run through it, and once your tests pass and you know that code looks good, you go ahead, you commit that code, uh, you push it to remote, and then you would open a pull request to have that code merged into master by whoever maintains, you know, the master repository of code. Uh, Jenkins can be configured to listen to our Git repos using something like the GitHub pull request builder plugin. And what the GitHub pull request builder plugin does is it pulls our source control, right? And whenever a new pull request comes in to a cookbook that we're managing, Jenkins can initiate a CI job to verify that this pull request adheres to our coding standard. And so in this slide, you know, we continue with a breakdown of, of what that CI job does. And what that CI job does is it basically verifies that our test kitchen tests actually succeeded uh, by running it again. Uh, the color coding here for Jenkins and test kitchen is a mix of both, uh, basically to indicate that what I'm talking about here is having test kitchen actually run locally on your Jenkins instances. Um, that's sometimes alarming to folks that are in a virtualized environment because what they hear is you want me to run a VM inside a VM, uh, but there are a lot of different ways around that, right? You can set up test kitchen drivers that dis uh, provision disposable infrastructure, uh, you know, in another cloud setting, right, running parallel to these test kitchen VMs, uh, or you can use local containers, right? There are a couple of clever ways to conduct unit testing in this sort of virtualized environment. Um, but the takeaway here is that Jenkins itself should be verifying that your code contributors did what you expect them to do, right, which is run some tests. Uh, this is also a great place to hook in linting tools or style checkers uh, just to make sure that, you know, everybody is adhering to proper coding standards. Uh, but the idea with this particular CI job is that if everything passes our automated sniff tests, right, then we can flag this change as being ready for human code review. And with the GitHub pull request builder plugin, what you see is you get a nice pretty little update on your pull request that flags this change as ready to consume by human eyes, right? It says, I have tested this 
and I bless this change and it's ready to go because it passed my basic test. Uh, but then that brings us to the code review process, right? And the code review process is a chance to implement whatever governance standards are appropriate for your organization. Uh, you can decide how changes are approved, right, or who owns responsibility for what content, uh, how new changes should be tested for aggressions, right, whatever suits the needs of your organization. Uh, you can configure the GitHub pull request builder plugin, you know, in my example, uh, to set rules around how pull requests are managed during code review, uh, you know, or you could use a more sophisticated code review tool if that suits your needs. Uh, but the idea here is that you structure that code review in, in some way. And uh, this can actually be one of the bigger snowflakes during your adoption process, uh, especially if the practice of code review is something that, does, that typically doesn't happen outside of development circles. Um, but this right here is, is the key part of the process where you can re-examine your existing deployment controls and then set some reasonable practices for working in a new non-traditional manner. Uh, it might take some time to get to go through that, and the larger and more complex your organization, uh, the more complicated figuring out that process might be, but I promise you that it is worth it. Um, for now, right, what we're going to say is that, uh, you know, we figured that out, our change passes our code review standards, whatever those might be, um, and then we're ready to deploy this change, right? And so what that means when we're ready to deploy is that we would take this short-lived branch that has finally passed all of these reviews um, and then merge it into the master branch for our cookbook. And then the short-lived branch can be deleted and removed. Um, so in this sort of setup, Jenkins would also monitor our master branch for new updates. Uh, and so anytime a new merge is made into master, right, master for our particular cookbook that we're, that we're changing, uh, Jenkins kicks off a CI job that more or less builds our cookbook. And uh, that's a little bit of a misnomer, right, because chef cookbooks are interpreted code. They're not statically compiled. And so what I mean when I say, quote, unquote, build our cookbook is that we effectively produce an artifact uh, from this cookbook Git repo, right? Um, what the CI job does is it rolls the version of this cookbook, uh, Shep follows semantic versioning, uh, major dot minor dot patch. And so what this means as a developer in this sort of cycle is it means that you as a developer own major dot minor and uh, the pipeline job owns patch, right? So, uh, so we increment the version of this cookbook correctly, right? Let the pipeline take control of that or let the CI job take control of that. Uh, we tag our Git repo with a particular version of this thing that, you know, we're about to release so that we're, we're in sync with what's actually being deployed. Uh, and then we upload a frozen or immutable version of this cookbook to our Chef server. Now, just because that new cookbook is on our Chef server, that doesn't mean that any of the nodes in our infrastructure are actually able to use it yet. Um, so here in this model, we use Chef's environment construct and what environments in Chef allow us to do is they allow us to explicitly pin versions of a particular cookbook to a particular subset of nodes. Uh, and this is where the rest of the steps, I think, become pretty repetitive and easy to follow, right? What you do from here is basically decide which environments should receive and test this change in what order, and then you string together a number of CI jobs in a pipeline that manage that deployment, right? From here on out, the structure of each promotion job is pretty much identical. You pin the new version of that cookbook to the environment that should receive it. Then you invoke Chef Client on every node in that environment that uh, uses this cookbook so they can all pull down the change and converge into the desired state. And then you run some tests to ensure that that change worked, right? So the process is you pin it, you converge it, and you test it, right? And all of these promotion jobs pin it, converge it, and test it, and you can string together a pipeline in a way that makes sense for your environment. So in this particular example, right, we see, hey, first we're going to go to, U, uh, to integration, and then we're going to go to UAT, and then production, right? But you may not want to do it that way. Maybe you want to canary test to production A, right, to a small subset of nodes, and if that works, then release it out to production B, right, and then production C until you finally have 100% coverage in production. 
Uh, you can slice and dice that in a number of ways that make sense for your organization. Um, but the thing to call out here is that the level of testing that is appropriate for each promotion can and should vary based upon what's, what's right for that environment, right? Are we gonna be running unit tests? Are we doing you know, functional integration tests? Are we doing load testing, right? Uh, the approach is the same, but you know the the details of how that's implemented might be a little bit different depending on where you're where you're promoting that change. And so, if we step back and we look at all of those steps as a whole, what we see is a pretty detailed plan describing a tool chain that is reliant on Chef and Jenkins to manage a change from happening on a local developer workstation all the way out to production. And so um, some of you might notice that um, while we're talking about managing change via cookbooks, um, I haven't really touched yet on, on how we build reusable application code binary artifacts, right? Uh, most of us are probably already using Jenkins to, to build our application and generate those binaries. Um, but how do we integrate that practice with Chef? Uh, I think historically there's been a little bit of a disconnect between the two and, and we've had a little bit of a rough handoff process. That means that we typically write some tooling to track which artifact belongs where, and then we feed that into Chef somehow, right? Hoping that we got the right thing that we needed from whatever artifact manager repository we're using. Um, and so, you know, maybe you're using Jenkins to build those binaries. And so the question would be, uh, how do we integrate those jobs that uh, have corresponding functions that probably even live on the same instance of Jenkins, right? How can we tie those things together in ways that operate a little bit better and more effectively? And so what that does is it brings us to today's demo, right? Today we're gonna look at the Jenkins traceability plugin for Chef, uh, and that plugin allows users to track which binaries are generated by Jenkins and tells you where they're used by Chef. So this enables us to you know, further integrate our two tool chains so that you can develop your application to make updates in ways that are you know, quicker, more efficient, and, and more reliable. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass off this presentation to Adam so that he can take us through a demo of this functionality. Adam, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. Still cannot hear you, Adam. Adam, are you there? Everyone, hold on just a minute. We'll try to get Adam's uh, audio squared away.
Thanks for your patience, everyone. Adam's uh, logging out of WebEx. He's going to log back in, and then hopefully that'll work. That'll fix the problem. George, are you there? I am. If Adam, uh, Adam, can you um, share your screen and uh, maybe just run through the demo? George, is there any commentary you can provide as Adam runs through the demo? Uh, unfortunately, I haven't seen the demo, so um, I could I could try talking around it, but I don't know how effective that would be. Okay. See if well, his his screen is sharing just nicely. <laughs> We're gonna see if we can get him to call in via phone. Okay, we're going to try one more thing here.
Adam. All right, you're, we're gonna do this via Skype audio, so you go ahead. I think everybody can hear you now. Alyssa, can you hear George? I cannot hear George. Uh -huh. George is on mute. You mean Adam? I'm sorry, Adam. Can you hear Adam? No, I cannot hear Adam. And we're not seeing his screen either. Okay, let's try. Okay, we're seeing the screen. I got I got him via Skype uh, audio. Um, they can't hear you on the uh, WebEx because the, the mic is muted when you speak, I guess. Let's try this. Um, uh, How about now? Can you hear me now? Alyssa, can you hear Adam? Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. Sounds a little far away, though. Yeah. Let me see if I can help. Go ahead, Adam. Fast start in memory chef server for testing and solo processes. 
set a segment like configures two servers, an in-memory chef server and a client, which will be our Tomcat server. And we can forward port in order to make the box accessible from the outside, so we can check if our traceability work indeed gets deployed to our Tomcat server. So we forward the 8080 ready to 8080 inside the box. And of course, we have to define what chef's recipes to use. I uh, would like to use the chef client instead of chef solo here, and we add the webinar codebook to our server. So this is all you need to know about this Vagrant config. So let's see see what how, uh, how does our codebook look like. Uh, in our codebook, we define what we want to be installed on our server, so we don't have to define it how. As George already told us, chef uses a pretty nice DSL language. So let's see how does our loading codebook look like. First, we have to ensure that the make package is installed. We do it using this uh, package, chef resource. Uh, this is a request for the chef handler gem. And then we install the chef handler Jenkins gem, which is also required. And then we set up a chef handler here. And we configure a Jenkins callback URL. So chef will send the reports to this URL. And to be more precise, it will send the report to this URL slash chef slash report. And then we want to have a Tomcat service. We define it here. And we just first we want to make sure that this traceability war will be deleted. And then this is the most important part, the group of file from our Jenkins and put it in the Tomcat web apps directory. This is done by the remote file chef resource. We don't define many options and parameters here, like the owner, the group, the mode, and the source. The source is the URL of the artifact we want to use. So in our case, it's always the last successful build artifact. So after retrieving the file, we are restoring the Tomcat service to rebuild the config and are able to deploy traceable war. We are doing this using the notifies parameter. A more realistic scenario would be asking our Jenkins to deploy the artifact to S3 or the Nexus repository grabbing this artifact from there. But to simplify the demo, I ended up retrieving the traceability war from the Jenkins itself. Okay, so it's time to put everything together. I've already installed Jenkins and started it, so it's up and running. So let's create a, a job using a script and template. All I need for this is a Jenkins CLI. I'm downloading it, and I have a script called create jobs. So it is creating the appropriate job. In our case, it's called the chef sample. Yes, it's here. Awesome. Empty. So let's build it. I'm going to show you the job config. This demo just is just using the each repository from a previous webinar, which is a pretty simple Hello World Maven project. And at the very end of the config, will explicitly tell Jenkins to archive the traceability war here. And when the artifact is saved, I mean, archived, the fingerprint is automatically created. The Jenkins is executing the MD5 sum function and it attaches this MD5 sum to the file. So, or just let's say it's saved to its MD5 database. Um, and of course, I'd like to mention that all the scripts used in this webinar will be shared with everyone in a few days in a blog post after this webinar, so you don't have to ask for it. So, okay, leave this page. And here we have the build is done. We have this traceability bar here. And here we have a little identity card icon here. This is the fingerprint card. And if you click here, you can see the fingerprint of this traceability bar. Yeah, you, you can see the MD5 hash in the right corner. So now that the build is has finished and the artifact has been produced, it's time to start up our Vagrant box. So my has been already started, so let's just drag run up. This will boot up the machine. And we have to wait a few seconds. Right. Almost there. Okay, 
I can run a regular provision, which will basically run and execute the cookbooks. I mean, it, it will enforce uh, the content of the cookbook. And um, we see that it, it is uploading a cookbook in, uh, to the in-memory chef server. And if chef is not running, it will install it. But I have already run this before, so it's installed. And it's running the chef client. Now it's running. And we can see chef execution steps in the logs. So it is loading the cookbook. And it is uh, enabling the chef render, removing the traceability war, and it's grabbing the traceability war from Jenkins. And at the very end of the generator report, uh, we'll see this JSON report. And this was being sent back to our Jenkins. So you can see it's only the chef resource file and chef resource remote file related changes were generated in this report. Uh, we can even see the MD5 hash of the trace of the war. So go back to our Jenkins and check the artifact details again. Refresh the page. And here we go. We have a chef logo here. It's great. So you can see here this artifact has been deployed on one. So this artifact has been deployed to the cloud based chef host, which is which was defined in a background file. So it was deployed to the correct environment. The environment is default. Chef is using the environment and default environment is a default. So this is why the default. We, we see the the exact path of where, where was this deployed and we see when it was deployed and maybe the, the previous version of this file. And uh, if we run it again, then we will see two reports. So just provision it again. Okay, uploading cookbooks. Great. It's running chef now. It's loading the cookbooks. Okay, thanks very much, Adam. And our apologies for the uh, uh, the problem, audio problems we had there. So now for the <coughs> uh, the Q and A. Again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, bring them. Uh, I'll put them into the Q&A window and we'll uh, answer those uh, questions uh, right away. Um, let's see, we've got one question. Um, this comes from Vivek. Um, George, this would be for you. Does Chef require root access? Does Chef require root access? Uh, well, typically the things that you're doing with Chef involve making changes to uh, system settings 
uh, installing software via RPM, things that require administrative access. Uh, is it possible to run Chef without root privileges? Uh, yes. Uh, I would say there are very few times and places where that is, you know, probably the right thing to do. Uh, but if you do, if you need to do that, it is possible. You have to jump through a couple of hoops, but um, typically the recommended practice would be to run it as root. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, there's one question. Just so that Chef mentioned it had deployed a war as a result of the Jenkins job, is it possible instead to deploy other types of artifacts, that is, install an EXE in Windows or apply RPM update packages in SUS rel, that slash rel. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to take that. So, um, yeah, as I understand it, right, this is for managing any sort of artifact that comes from Jenkins. Uh, in terms of installing EXEs on Windows, uh, Windows is one of the supported platforms by, uh, by show, or supported by Chef. Uh, Test Kitchen support um, is also there for Windows, so you can start Windows VMs and test against them as quickly and disposably as you can with Linux-based uh, virtual machines. Uh, I, I need to check on the exact status of it. I know that Windows support for Test Kitchen is currently available in a branch. Uh, I'm not sure if it's been merged to master yet, but if it's not there yet, uh, it will be. So yeah, absolutely, you could take these same types of updates and apply them to Windows nodes. Okay, great. All right, we're uh, we're out of time. Uh, any other questions? We will uh, we will get to. Oh, it's one more question here. Does Chef use something like a snapshot to revert any manual changes made to nodes, or does it only apply settings outlined in a recipe? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I think a, a quick way to to talk about this. We everything in Chef is explicit, right? And if you want to apply contra state. Uh, such as a snapshot, you can, but you have to model it. Uh, usually it's it's a little more effort than it's worth. Uh, when it comes to managing change with Chef, a recommended practice and usually a less painful practice is to roll forward into the desired state you want to be in rather than trying to, you know, manage all the dependencies of somehow magically undoing all the things that, that you've done with the new change. And then one more for you, George. Is there uh, a web logic cookbook? Uh, I don't know specifically about WebLogic. Uh, I know I answered a lot of questions in the Q&A session, and uh, take a look there. If not, what we're going to do is we're going to do a write-up of this uh, particular webinar, and I can leave a link to Supermarket there. Uh, I should also say Supermarket is just a fraction of the cookbooks that you will find out in uh, on the Internet anywhere. Uh, Supermarket, you can sign up for and, uh, and directly contribute to the chef community. Sometimes folks are not able to do that, and so you'll find a number of other cookbooks uh, on GitHub. So if you don't find it on Supermarket, I'd say look for one on GitHub. All right, great. And I know there were a couple of questions that were uh, more on the Jenkins side, so since uh, we don't have Adam's audio, we'll send those out when we uh, send out the, uh, the links to the uh, webinars. Thanks very much, everyone, for attending. Uh, we hope that you found it uh, informative. And if you have uh, any further questions, feel free to uh, uh, send an email to the two participants or to uh, info at cloudbees.com. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.